So today we'll talk about um, dimensionality reduction, in particular PCA, discriminant analysis, and manifold learning. So the first technique that we're going to talk about will be principal component analysis, or PCA. From the things that we're talking about today, this is by far the most commonly used and the most important to understand. If you go anywhere doing data science, everybody will assume you know how this technique works. Who here has heard of PCA before? Okay, most people, that's good. Um, so we'll go through the theory a little bit and then try to get some intuition of what it does in practice and why and how we wanna use it. So I wanna first discuss uh, what the method does. So assume you have a data set that is shown on the top left here. Uh, there's two input features and um, I colored them in some way just to visualize better what's going on. And so what uh, the principal component analysis does is it iteratively finds the direction of largest variance within the data. So this is um, a direction from like assuming we have centered the data um, that explains most of the variance. So this would be the first component. Then, iteratively, it removes the projection on this component and finds the next component. Be if you remove the projection on the first component, this means anything that you find afterwards will be orthogonal. So that's one of the main properties of PCA is that it finds directions that are orthogonal. And uh, the first component that is found will explain most of the variance in the data. The second component will be the one that's orthogonal and explains um, most of the remaining variation and so on. Another good way to think about this is to view the data as being generated by some Gaussian distribution. In this example, it is actually uh, like a synthetic Gaussian distribution. And the principal component analysis tries to find uh, the axes of the, this Gaussian distribution. So the first component will be the axis with the biggest variance, second component will be axis with the second biggest variance, and so on. Once we've, we found these components, there are several things we can uh, do with principal component analysis. The um, easiest way to think about what these components mean is that you can think of these as a rotation. So you can now, having these fit these components, you can rotate the data into a new coordinate system where uh, the mean is at, so you subtract the mean, so you have a mean zero. And then the first feature corresponds to the first principal component, the second feature corresponds to the second principal component, and so on. So here you can view a visualization of this uh, rotated data. The reason why this makes sense to think of this as rotation is because uh, the components are orthogonal. So you can just rotate the data and then the components will line up with the um, axes. What PCA is very commonly used for is, as the title of the lecture suggests, dimensionality reduction. The way that uh, you use PCA to do dimensionality reduction is to drop some of the components. So usually you want to uh, keep, say, the top k components and you throw away the lower components that have smaller variants. In 2D, this is all a little bit boring because um, the first component perfectly determines the second component because there's only one orthogonal vector. And um, so if I want to keep anything, the only thing I can do is I can drop the second component and um, so now I made my data one dimensional and this one dimension now corresponds to the direction of uh, maximum variance in your original data. So basically I created a new axis. This axis is this, di this diagonal here, uh, x equal minus x or something like this. That's what component one points into. And I just dropped the second uh, principal component. So now I have a one dimensional data set. You can think of this as um, a reduction of the dimensional KE or as a compression of the data because now uh, each point in the original data set is expressed using just a single number. 
can also think about how much do I lose by doing this compression, by doing this dimensionality reduction. And uh, after I drop the component, I can rotate back to the original space, um, which is shown here in the, in the last panel. And you can see basically how this uh, one dimensional um, feature maps into the original space. <coughs> There are several ways to uh, formalize what um, a PCA does. So one objective that is sort of intuitive and makes sense um, is it tries to find the best approximation that has rank K, so that lives on a subspace of dimensionally t uh, TK. Um, this objective basically says, I, I want to find something, in this case here, maybe one dimensional, that uh, fits this data as well as possible. And so here, if I do this, um, I find the x prime, so that the rank, say, is one in this example, that's close, approximates x, I would get uh, this as x prime. And that would be one way to um, formalize uh, what PCA does. In terms of how it is computed, it's usually computed in terms of um, uh, the, um, covariance matrix, so you can show that this is um, the same as finding the direction of maximum variance, and um, so it's the maximum variance, um, so, sorry, we find, want to find a vector of unit length in uh, our, our space that, so that uh, if we rotate x, to, sorry, if we apply x to that, uh, we capture the maximum variance, and you can very easily say that's the same as uh, if you, like, variance is basically just squ squaring this um, an expectation, so that's the same as ut1 covariance of x uh, u, and, do I have a, and this is, um, if you remember your linear algebra class, this is solved by uh, eigen decomposition of the covariance matrix. So the, the principal components so the first principal component is just the biggest eigenvector of the covariance matrix. Second principal component is the second eigenvector of the covariance matrix, and so on. Um, so in practice, you can show that this you can do this even simpler in not doing the computing the covariance matrix, but you can directly compute the singular value decomposition of uh, the original data x, and so. Um, you hopefully remember the singular value decomposition. It, X is decomposed as uh, a rotation in the original space, a diagonal matrix containing the singular values, and the rotation, uh, sorry. The first one is a rotation that the ensemble time the ensembles. Uh, and in the center is a, a diagonal matrix that, um, containing the singular mat values, and <coughs> then there's a orthogonal matrix that's n feature times n features. So the diagonal uh, matrix in the center uh, with the singular values is, um, these are the, pr the eigenvectors, so these are uh, usually sorted in decreasing order, and so then the first vector in V would be your first principal component. <coughs> and you would, uh, if you want to compute the, the uh, reduced version of this, in the original space, you can just drop some of the um, components of V or set some of the diagonal on D equal to zero, and you'll get a lower rank approximation. Or if you want to look at the embedding space, so this U is basically X impressed in the embedding space, so the, um, so the first uh, column would correspond D times the first column would correspond um, to the data in the embedded space. Okay. I thought I had a nicer visualization again, but um, I mean, it really, I think um, usually you don't have to worry too much about uh, how this decomposition is constructed, and I really find it most helpful to think about it as fitting a Gaussian and then finding the axes of the Gaussian. <coughs>
and then rotating so that it's uh, axis aligned. Questions? question is, can we use PCA on sparse data? And uh, because we cannot center sparse data. So we will talk about a trick, basically, which is just compute the principal component, uh, sorry, just compute a singular valid decomposition and don't subtract the mean, but that's sort of a hack. Uh, that's what people in the, we're gonna talk about this when we talk about natural language processing, because that's what people in the natural language community have been done for a long time. You can actually also implicitly in the algorithm subtract the mean, and so it is possible, but uh, it's not right now implemented in scikit-learn. Because we sort of in scikit-learn, we, we naively subtract the mean and then it blows up. All right, so one application of the system actually reduction for Compression. If you have a lower dimensional space, you can um, you have a smaller model, maybe a more interpretable model. It is often also seen as denoising. You can think of here the main signal only being along this direction and this here being noise, and you're removing the noise, noise dimension. There's um, Another thing you can do with PCA, which is uh, after you, which is called whitening, which basically means you do the transformation or the rotation given by PCA, and then you scale the data again. So usually you want to um, scale the data before doing PCA, but if you scale the data again after doing PCA, this is called whitening. This is a term from signal processing, and it basically means that you give, um, the same weight to all of the principal components. Even though the first principal component explains most of the variance in the data, you, think you um, treat the second principal component or the third principal component or the fourth as important as the first one. So basically, after freeing your Gaussian, you make it into a ball. That's what's shown here. There's um, an option whiten, whiten equal to true in a PCA, but it's literally the same as doing PCA and then standard scalar. One of the applications where I use PCA a lot is for exploratory data analysis and visualization. So here I'm using the uh, breast cancer data set. Um, as always with visualizations, I wanna go down to uh, two dimensions. And so if I have a high dimensional data set, I can't immediately um, visualize it, but I can use PCA to project it down to two dimensions. Um, PCA is a transformer. I set it n components equal to two, called fit transform and I get XPCA back, which is um, now a two-dimensional data set. Then I can do scatter, and um, here this is a scatter plot, and I also show PCA.components. PCA.components are the component vectors. And so you can see here, zero is the first principal component, one is the second principal component, and you can see that, uh, how much each of the features contributes to each principal component. So maybe first looking at the plot on the right hand side, do you notice anything on the plot on the right hand side? So these are the coefficients in the principal components for all of the different input features. So you can see here that basically the coefficients in the PCA are zero for mostly, for, except for uh, two of these features. Um, you might think, oh, this means these are the important ones, but this is actually not what is happening. Um, here, as you could see, I did not scale the data. If one of the features ha has a much larger scale than the data, uh, than the rest of the features, this feature will be picked up as the principal component. If you scale 
one feature by a large number, that basically means you scale the variance of that feature by a large number, um, because it's linear, and so you, you just get that feature. So if you don't scale your data, or if the scale of your data is not, has not thematic meaning, then uh, PCA will just tell you which, coefficient, uh, which feature has the largest magnitude or the largest variance, which is not really interesting. So here is the same thing using a uh, pipeline from standard scalar and PCA, and um, I get a slightly more interesting plot. Um, here is the uh, coefficient vectors after I use scaling, and you can see that uh, now basically all the features participate in uh, both of the principal components. So what's nice here, I think, is that um, we might not have been able to visualize the whole data set, and there's like I don't know, 16 features or something, so it would be hard to visualize all of them at once. But we can see here, it, this PCA is completely unsupervised algorithm. It doesn't know that this is a classification task, and we're trying to classify um, uh, breast cancer was not breast cancer. We just uh, find the direction of maximum variance and project onto them. What I did here then is I colored the data points according to the class they belong to that PCA does know nothing about. And I can actually see in this new projection the data is basically linearly separable. It's maybe hard to understand what the axes here mean, but um, at least I know there is rotation in the original space, and now uh, I do this rotation, I can do a linear separation. So this tells me that if I apply a linear model, I expect it to do pretty well on this data set. And maybe I would think a linear model is even the best model for this data set because there's a very, like, uh, there's a very clear boundary here. It also tells me the data set is very simple. So I went, and very redundant, I went from, yeah, whatever, 16 dimensions or something to, oh, does it say here? No. Um, to two dimensions, but even though that I basically discarded most of the information, the two first principal components already captured a, um, capture the classes uh, nearly perfectly. So here on the left hand side, um, again, these are the coefficients of the components. Um, on the, sorry, these are the, the, just the entries of the components. On the right hand side, there's a um, different kind of visualization that I find a little bit harder to read, but basically it shows you the first and the second principal component, and for each uh, feature, it puts it into this two dimensional space. Um, so this is just, this is, these two visualizations show exactly the same data, only in two different ways. And you can see that the first principal component uh, is basically independent of texture error, and the second principal component is basically independent of worse concave points, um, and so on. All right, this is PCA for visualization. So later in the lecture, we'll talk about more complex methods for visualization, but the reason why I like this is A, it doesn't, it's unsupervised, so um, you're not really, you can't really overfit the data much because you're not giving it the target information in a supervised setting. And the other is, it gives you a rotation. At least I have a pretty good like mental model of what a rotation does. Um, and or what a projection does. And that's much easier to understand than what a lot of the other models do. So even though here now this, um, in this plot, this axis is a, linear, um, is a linear combination of all the input features with some weights, maybe this axis is not super easy to understand, but I know this axis exists somewhere in the original space. It's just like the lines somehow. So, because I think rotations are relatively easy to understand, I like PCA as a visualization method. Um, another application of PCA is regularization. In particular, in um, people that come more from a stats background, 
Um, they are interested in doing unbiased estimates of coefficients. And uh, if we use regularization, uh, you don't get an unbiased estimate anymore. So a different way to uh, regularize your model is to project it down to a lower dimensional space and then learn a, a linear model in this lower dimensional space. So this is particular for linear models. You could do this for any kind of model that sort of makes sense for linear models uh, sort of the most. So here let's say I have uh, my breast cancer data set, I find that I fit logistic regression with a very big C that basically turns off regularization and uh, I get a near perfect training score and I get a test score that's quite a bit worse. So now I want to compare this against using PCA as an initial try because we saw that in two dimensions I can separate this already pretty well. So I use PCA with two components, uh, use the unregularized model and um, well, I'm overfitting less because the training error went down, but the test error also went down. So maybe this was not like the ideal thing to do. So now I, what I could do is I could uh, grid search, for example, how many components to keep. And uh, the fewer components I keep, the, more, the stronger I regularize the model. Because um, in the original space, logistic regression was learning like 15 components or 16 components, uh, sorry, 16 coefficients. In the reduced space, now we're only le learning uh, two coefficients. So it's much easier to robustly find two coefficients than it is to find uh, 16. You could also do a similar trick for regression. So we talked about how linear regression um, can behave pretty terribly if you have lots of features. You can use PCA to reduce the number of features um, to a more reasonable amount, and then you could use standard logistic regression linear regression without using regularization. Um, another way to figure out how many components to keep is uh, what's called a scree plot. I should put a scree plot somewhere on here. A scree plot is showing you what part of the variance is covered by the first k components. So this is basically uh, like a cumulative sum of the variance explained. And um, I plotted here the explained variance ratio, which means of the overall variance in the data set, how much is explained by the first k components. And I plotted the same thing. This is a logarithm. So this is the this is a plot in linear space. And this is a plot in logarithmic space. So both of them show the same line, only one in linear and one in logarithmic space. Um, and so the idea here is that we can see how much of the variance do we keep if we keep only the first uh, k components. And so um, you can see here, okay, if, if you look just at this plot, you would, might say, oh, maybe um, using four or five components is sort of good. Um, I guess actually here is like a small kink. Maybe I would use uh, six component that will cover like 90% of my variance. Um, but that's sort of, um, so it's probably, it's not an entirely bad idea to say, oh, I want to cover 90% of my variance. Um, if you look at the logarithmic plot, it's like a very, would be a very arbitrary choice where you want to cut off. What we can see in the logarithmic plot though is that um, after component 26, the explained variance decreases very rapidly. So looking at this plot, I would feel very confident to throw away everything that comes after 26. So, um, this also tells me uh, the original space was not 16 features, as I said earlier, it's like 28 features or 29 features. Um, all right. So obviously there can be not more components than there are features uh, because that's the original space and there can only be that many orthogonal vectors. Do you kind of lose any interpretability, interpretability that you have when you use PCA before you use regression? The question is, 
do you lose interpretability when you do um, PCA before you do regression? Um, and uh, I'll tell you on the next slide. So, oh, just uh, basically here, I looked at this plot, I think, and I saw maybe there's a king here, or maybe I just think, well, afterwards this get goes very flat, so I don't care so much. I put in n components equal to six, and um, you can see that my result is actually better than the original model. So we get slightly less overfit. It goes from 99% um, training error to 98% training error, but it also goes from 94% test error to 95% test error. Oh, the question is, how did I figure out where 90% of explains variance is? So you could actually put in n components equal 0.9, and it would do that automatically for you. Um, here, I mean, 90% would be 10% is not explained, and so basically at 0.1, I would draw the line. Point one is actually here. So I guess if I, it's more like 95% or something like this. So, I mean, I'm very roughly eyeballing this. You can do this exact, and Scikit-learn gives you the tools to do this exactly. Like often people have something like, you want 90 or 95% of the variance, or even 99% of the variance. If you want 99% of the variance, you'll probably end up like somewhere over here. Um. Can we get the eigenvalues through scikit-learn? Because I mean, there's also the criterion of having an eigenvalue that is, should be bigger than one per component. Uh, and the second question would be, um, can scikit-learn do parallel analysis? Uh, basically compare okay. to. So the question, the first question was, can we access the, uh, access the singular values? The answer is yes. Um, uh, the, I have not heard the criterion of singular value equal to, or bigger than one. Um, but maybe you can give me a reference for this. Uh, what was the second question? Um, so so there's, there's something called parallel analysis where you basically randomly sample a data set and you uh, extract the uh, components um, and then you basically see where the curves cross between the randomly sampled components and the components that you extracted from your real data and uh, you would take that as a cutoff um, with, the, with the reason that uh, when the point cross, your data does not perform any better than chance anymore. Yeah, okay, so the question is basically, uh, I think, um, do we have a tool to do um, a permutation analysis of, the, um, of what is a good cutoff point, and I don't think we do. Um, Generally, it depends a little bit on what is your goal. If your goal is um, supervised learning, I would just grid search it because you have a metric to evaluate. Um, if your goal is some unsupervised learning, like extracting interesting information, then it's uh, very hard to come up with any rigorous criterion usually. And so, yeah, so, so basically in this, uh, class, I want to focus more on your end goal of classification, then you have an evaluation criteria, and then you can just brute force it if you want. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's like many heuristics how to do this, and I mean, the permutation uh, seems like a reasonable one. Um, okay, so do I lo lo lose interpretability? So, um, now here is my, I have my PCA with um, six components. I learn logistic regression on these six components. So I have six coefficients. What do these coefficients mean in my original feature space? Um, because PCA is just a rotation, I can invert the rotation with uh, inver uh, inverse transform. And so here I had a pipeline, so I get the PCA from the pipeline in the logistic regression, and I use the inverse transform of the PCA, apply it to the coefficient of the logistic regression, and this will now give me a coefficient that is in the original feature space. So LR coef has length six, because I had six 
um, principal components. Quf PCA has sized the original feature space, which is like 28 or 29. And so I would say this is as interpretable um, because you can project back to your initial space. And here on the left-hand side, you can see an unregularized model fitted on the original data versus ones fit on the PCA, uh, on data with PCA and then rotated back. Um, and they sort of look similar. Um, you can, uh, here I plotted basically on the x-axis for each feature, um, what is the coefficient value for no, without PCA and with PCA, and you see that they're like, somewhat loosely related, but clearly they're not the same because um, the model uh, without doing PCA actually perform performed worse and it actually and has many more degrees of freedom. So this only basically has only six degrees of freedom or seven with intercept, the other one has like 29 degrees of freedom. Other questions? Um, okay, the question is, how do I rotate from the six-dimensional back to the original space? So basically, it's a rotation and then a projection. So you rotate the space and then you forget all of the lower coefficients. And so if you rotate back, you basically, you set all of these other ones to zero. So you will only rotate using the first six principal components in the direction in the, and, yeah, and in the direction of the other principal component, you will just have zero in these directions. Yes, you basically you multiply by the inverse of the PCA matrix. Um, so, and you pad all of your, your six dimensional feature vector with like many zeros, and then you can rotate it back. I mean, in reality, you wouldn't obviously do that, but um, that, that's sort of the idea of what happens. All right, so one caveat maybe is, that, uh, I mean, as I said, PCA is unsupervised. This can be a good thing or a bad thing. So here I have a three-dimensional data set um, that I made up of all Gaussian data. And uh, so this is a synthetic data set that I made up to make PCA fail. Uh, so unsurprisingly, uh, PCA doesn't help us with this. So let's say I have these, um, this three-dimensional data set. I want to reduce it with PCA and um, then I want to classify it. However, the way the data is constructed, um, basically the direction that uh, distinguishes uh, the purple from the yellow points is orthogonal to, uh, to this line. And so um, that means that PCA will throw away uh, all the important information. So here, if I project on the principal components, um, if I just keep the first two, which are the important ones to explain the variance in the data, they will be completely uninformative because I constructed a data set so that all the information is in the third component. Um, how realistic is that this will happen in practice? Maybe not that realistic, but um, just keep in mind that you can destroy valuable class information even though it ha ha has like low variance in the data. So here, again, if, if I basically go from two, two, two dimensions, for, from three dimensions to two dimensions, I would just get this, but all the information is in the third principal component by construction. Another um, application of PCA is for feature extraction, which is actually quite similar like to dimension alpha reduction. Um, this was an application where PCA was quite um, commonly used before neural networks took over everything, is for uh, recognizing faces. So there's an approach called eigenfaces, 
which basically given the data set of faces that are aligned, you can see them here on the top left, you decompose or you basically you, uh, do a principal component analysis uh, on these faces and you get these wonderfully looking eigenfaces here. Another way to look at PCA is that each data point is now expressed as linear combinations and these are sort of like pro the components act as sort of prototypes. So you can take Y on a writer here and express her as X0 times the first component, X1 times the second component, and so on. And um, then, so here X0, X1, X2, X3, these correspond to the coefficients after PCA, so in the, in the rotated space. And you could use these as features. Um, so actually, I, I think I didn't say that before, but one thing with PCA directions is the sign doesn't mean anything. So it's uh, only the direction matters. If you look at the Gaussian, if you say like, oh, the, uh, the di direction of maximum variance is in this way, you can also say it's in this way. There's like no distinction. Or to say another way, eigenvalues don't have a sign. Like whether you pick v as the eigenvalue, uh, as the eigenvector, or minus v as the eigenvector, it's, uh, it's arbitrary. So if you, whenever you see uh, coefficients of principal components never interpret like which ones are positive and which ones are negative because uh, it's as valid to just take the negative of everything. So uh, this is here particularly a, a caveat because um, here you, if you invert these, these eigenfaces they would look quite different and so it's kind of a little bit hard to understand what they do um, without taking the sign into account. I'm not entirely sure I know how to do that. So this component basically says there's a gradient in light between the left and the right hand side. So whether the light comes from the left or from the right. So here you can see the light comes from the left. Here you can see the right comes from the the light comes from the right. Um, and this component says how much does the light come from the left? But you could have is, as easily comp the same component could say how much does the right come from the, the light come from the right, and it doesn't matter. Um, if you do feature extraction here in this case, um, well maybe it's like more an empirical fact, or maybe you can think it makes sense is that we uh, do whitening, meaning we we um, scale all these, uh, these uh, feature values after we apply the PCA. So that means each of these templates uh, has the same weight. So here by, on this data set, uh, this actually has loaders and scikit-learn. It's the uh, labeled faces in the wild, and it's people that are famous in the 90s, or that were in, um, in news articles in the 90s, I think. Um, so we can do a uh, 10 years neighbor here. So if we do a complicated model, actually doing this ex uh, feature extraction will not do a lot. So I'm using the simplest model I can think of, which is a nearest neighbor classifier. So if I run a nearest neighbor classifier directly on the pixels, I get an accuracy of uh, 0.23. If I um, use a PCA with 100 components, I get, an, and then I do a nearest neighbor classifier, I get an accuracy of uh, 0.31. And you can see that before uh, I had like, I have 100, uh, sorry, 1,500 training samples, and before the images were like 5,655 dimensional, it's just the number of pixels in the image, so it's pretty high dimensional. And then doing the PCA, I can reduce to just 100 and uh, this representation actually seems to be more semantic. So th these days, this is not what you would do for faces, but it's sort of an interesting application um, to try to understand how PCA works. Um, another interesting aspect of how you can look at PCA is you can look at um, 
how important are the components by looking at reconstruction error. So here you can see um, uh, these three faces, the original face, and how it is reconstructed with 10 components, 50 components, 100 components, and 500 components. And so um, if I want to pick the number of components to use here in the PCA, um, it's pretty obvious to me that doing 10 components is not enough. Um, actually, 500 components seems, like, uh, seems pretty good. So 500 components would be a factor of 10 in a reduction of dimensionality. Um, so maybe doing like the 100 components seem to work pretty well for this image, which is pretty axis aligned. This one is a little bit tilted. And so for these images, it doesn't work as well. So this is maybe another way to look at how many components do I need to represent my data is by looking at how well can I reconstruct the data and does the reconstructed data still have the information that I need? Like, there's no way I can recognize this guy from, from 10 components. Who here recognizes the first guy? No? No one? Oh. I know there's some Germans here. Well, <laughs> anyway, um, you can also use this to detect outliers. We'll talk about outlier detection a bit more in a couple of uh, days, weeks, or something like that. Um, you can look at things that were well reconstructed and things that were not well reconstructed, things that are well reconstructed by PCA, you can think of as they have high likelihood under our Gaussian model um, and things that are not so well reconstructed, they're like unlikely under our Gaussian model. And so, um, or you can think of it as like how far out am I in the data set? And you can see these guys here are the ones with the best reconstructions. They're all very axis aligned and uh, the lighting is very homogeneous, and um, apparently David Beckham is sort of the average face. Um, and here these are um, very badly reconstructed, and you can see they are often, uh, have their head tilted, they have like uh, a shirt, glasses, or a hat, and so they're harder to reconstruct because they have these weird features in there. Other questions on PCA? Well, as I said in the very beginning, basically I often think of PCA as fitting one a, a Gaussian to my data cloud. So I have my data points and I fit one Gaussian and I look at the, um, the directions of variance for uh, the Gaussian. So here basically I mean, you have uh, deduction of maximum various, second most variance and so on. And uh, what PCA does is basically just gives you these axes. Like, the, I mean, it's just the eigenvalue decomposition of the covariance matrix. Like uh, the, the Gaussian is sort of an ellipses and you have the different axes in the ellipses and this is what PCA gives you. I'm not now sure I understand the question. Um, so each each principal component contains all the, uh, a combination of all the features. Of all the features, yes. All right. So the next thing I want to talk about is um, discriminant analysis. Oh, we're never going to get through all of this today. Great. So in discriminant analysis, these are actually supervised models. I didn't talk about them um, before because they're not supervised models that are very commonly used in practice these days um, because they're quite simple. Um, but they're good to understand and they can help you, um, for example, in visualization or general dimensionality reduction. It's also just good models to know about. And um, these are I'm going to talk about linear discriminant analysis, which is also called Fisher's discriminant and quadratic discriminant analysis. Both of these are instances of um, like 
I think people call as uh, Bayesian classifiers, where uh, you have a probabilistic model of your data, or generally uh, you can think of this as being a generative model. So these are classifiers using a generative model. And so the idea is that we model the probability of um, at y, so that the label is a given class k, given the data, using base rule. Um, so using base rule, this is the same as the probability of x given y as this class times probability of uh, y given this class and uh, divided by p of x. And so, uh, I can write the probability of the data x as a probability uh, over all the classes. So for this model, uh, to, to make this into an actual model, I need to write down a probability distribution for each class. So what, I'm, what I need here is I need to um, have a way to compute p of x uh, given y equal to k. So if I have a way to fit a probabilistic model for each class, I can compute this, and then I basically, for a new data point, I ask for which class do I get the highest probability that's the right class? And um, what linear, uh, linear discriminant analysis does is it um, fits uh, the Gaussian model to each class where the covariance matrix is shared and each class has a different mean. So um, if you write this down, this is what you get. Um, so this is basically the probability of x given y equal to k is, um, is this. So this is just the Gaussian distribution with covariance matrix sigma and uh, mean uh, mu k. And so we estimate this joint covariance matrix. So they all, we have a covariance matrix that is um, the same for all classes, but it's not for the overall data set, it's for the individual classes, and each of them has a new, has a mean. And once we fit this, we can um, compute, uh, ask what is the probability, or what is um, the probability ratio between class, uh, K and L, and uh, you can see that it actually uh, it turns out to be a linear classifier in a rotated space. So linear discriminant analysis is a, a linear classifier. Um, it's very easy to compute because you only need to compute the means and the covariance matrix. So there's basically, there's a closed form solution. If you look at um, logistic regression, logistic regression, we need to have an iterative solver that tries to optimize this, uh, uh, this uh, maximum likelihood estimate. Here we can just compute the means and the variance and we're done, or covariance. The, the um, expensive part is computing um, the inverse of the covariance matrix. There's um, a slight variant of this called quadratic discriminant analysis. And um, so this is all the data I just talked about. The difference in quadratic discriminant analysis is that you also have a covariance matrix for each of the classes. So it's just a more flexible version of linear discriminant analysis. Um, The reason why you would want the first one is because it's sort of obviously it's simpler. Um, estimating uh, this uh, or inverting this covariance matrix, if you're in very high dimensions, this can be unstable or it can take a long time. So inverting it only once or estimating only once can be easier. You can also uh, put restriction on this covariance matrix, say we want it to be that diagonal. If we allow these only to be a di diagonal, then the computation will be much easier like much, much easier. But then we basically, we, I guess we end up with a Gaussian naive base model then. So maybe, maybe we don't want that. Um, anyway, 
here is a comparison from a second learn uh, example. So here, this is a linear discriminant analysis. Um, here, the synthetic data edge has the same covariance for both of the classes. And you can see this ellipsis is the Gaussian that is fitted to each of the classes. You have the mean here and the mean here. And um, then this is the covariance matrix. You can see this is not the covariance of the whole data set. The co if I look at the covariance of the whole data set, it would be more like this. It is a shared covariance for both of the classes. If they don't have shared covariance, so for example here, this, data, this class is like more horizontal, this class is more vertical, then um, linear discriminant analysis can't fit that very well, and um, the quadratic discriminant analysis can fit that. So quadratic discriminant analysis has its name because the decision boundary is quadratic in the inputs. So these are nice as, like if you want a really simple classifier, at least if you don't have like a tons of dimensions, if you have tons of dimensions, they might not work so well. Um, but um, what's cool about these is that uh, for the linear discriminant analysis, basically the sigma gives you also like um, uh, something like a rotation, um, like a rotation and a stretch of the initial, uh, of your input data. And so this gives you a global transformation in a way that each component is best to, to discriminate between the classes. Um, so basically, it's, um, you can do this uh, sigma to the minus one of x. This will give you sort of a transformed version of x. And then in this space, um, the interesting components are basically the components that uh, connect the means. Um, yeah. So you can think of the difference between the discriminants and PCA is so the discriminants are clearly they're supervised. Um, PCA fits a single Gaussian model for everything. P, um, the discriminant analysis fits uh, multiple uh, Gaussian models, uh, possibly with the shared covariance. But you can think of both as being a transformation of the space. Um, a restriction of the LDA, though, is that you can um, can only get a maximum of number of classes minus one many components. Because as I said, the components are sort of, um, sp are spanned by the class means. And the space that is spanned by the class means is number of classes minus one dimensional. So here is sort of an, an example of applying this to like another synthetic data set. Here, this is an original data set, three classes, they're very clearly linearly separable. And so, but now let's say I want to transform this into something that is like even more obviously it's linearly separable. Oh, I think, I guess this was, uh, oh, is this two dimensional? I guess, I'm not sure if there's more dimensions with noise or if I just created the data in two dimensions, it's also possible. Well, if I compute PCA, so PCA will fit one global Gaussian model, and sort of that will say, oh, the covariance is something like like this, maybe. Um, whereas um, linear discriminant analysis will um, here again we can project to two dimensions, but the first dimension will be the one that distinguishes best among the classes. And so we get um, the differences between the means. And so this is like very obvious the right, the right direction to separate the classes. And so this is sort of a nice projection. We can apply this to the data set where um, sort of PCA failed. So my synthetic example where all the information was in the third principal component and LDA will just pick up the third, th this component and say this is the discriminant. In this case, it's a two-class cl two classification problem, so LDA will only give you a single component, 
which I plotted on the x-axis, and the y-axis is just the first feature. Because I want to create a 2D scatter plot. Clearly, sort of LDA here has much more information because it's a supervised model. But so it can also possibly give me more interesting visualization because it knows what I'm looking for, which is the classes. Questions on LDA? Yes. Um, I don't have written down the formulas, but um, I mean, basically, you, you um, use sigma to the minus one times x, and that gives you um, a new x that's of the same dimensionality as the original x. Um, and then, so this is basically just a distortion of the space using the covariance matrix. So actually, I think you should, what you should do is you use um, the square root of sigma. So you do, um, do like a QR decomposition. Um, so you get the square root of sigma, you apply that to x, and then in that space, you can look at the um, vector spanned by the means in that space. So um, if you look at mu k minus mu l in that space, um, you get a, a, a component or a direction vector and you project onto these direction vectors. So the next thing I want to talk about is manifold learning. And um, that's sort of a catch-all phrase for doing dimensionality reduction that is not linear. So both LDA and PCA were models that are um, gave you some rotation or uh, like a linear transformation of the original space. Manifold learning is just saying, oh, I want a non, um, Nonlinear transformation of my space. The idea here is um, why is this called manifold learning? So, a manifold is an embedding of a lower dimensional space into a higher dimensional space. So, here in this 3D image of what's called the Swiss roll, um, there's sort of um, you can see a two dimensional space like a ribbon embedded into this three dimensional space. And so, you, the goal here would be to unroll the Swiss roll and identify the underlying two-dimensional space. So um, one might think that, for example, the, po the points that are here in red are more similar to the points here than to the points down here, because there's sort of a path on this data manifold, uh, or on this manifold they're closer to the, or the red points are closer to the orange point than to the green point, even though in the Euclidean distances um, maybe they're closer to the green points. So I'll talk through a couple of these algorithms, mostly one, um, but you should keep in mind these are basically only for visualization. Um, the reason is that the axes don't really correspond to anything. Um, Often, you can also not transform new data, so you can only apply this to a given data set. So if you did this on your training set and someone gave you a test set, you cannot apply it to your test set independently. Um, but it can always give you pretty pictures for your report or your paper, and it always looks impressive. Um, it's, it can be helpful for doing exploratory data analysis because it allows you to like, figure out are things in your data, figure out, maybe see some groupings, see some, some things that vary continuously in the data and so on. Um, I've also seen people use these to extract additional features to add to the original features. So that's, I'm not sure if that's like really standard practice. So there's a bunch of algorithms in scikit-learn. Um, uh, kernel PCA, spectral embedding, local linear embedding, isomap, and TSNE. And um, they are all either like 
motivated by kernel methods or by graph methods, except for the last one, which is like motivated by a probabilistic method, and um, they all have like nice math to go along, but I think in practice, maybe I see sometimes the spectral embedding in the kernel PCA. I, I think I never see isomap and locally linear embedding anymore. Most people always use TSNE. And um, because these algorithms are used mostly for visualization, the space we go to is a, usually a two or three dimensional space. So these are um, always meant to go to two dimensions, basically. Um, because TSNE is by far the most commonly used, I wanna on talk only through TSNE uh, in a little bit more detail, because you're likely to encounter it in practice or you're likely to try to do it to make your uh, report look more interesting. So, uh, TSNE stands for T-Stochastic uh, Neighbor Embedding, um, and um, it uses basically two sort of probability distributions um, between neighbors. Um, one is a Gaussian in the original space, and the other one is um, um, a T, uh, a student T distribution in the embedding space. And so this defines this um, P of J given I as um, the Gaussian's, uh, or Gaussian kernel between um, Xi and Xj divided by all the neighbors, or sorry, uh, all the other data points um, Xi minus Xk, where K is not equal to J. So this is sort of how likely are you, if I'm gonna pick a neighbor or a, a different data point with Gaussian probabilities according to the distance, uh, how likely am I going to pick J instead of any of the other ones? And so usually you can restrict this to sort of a K neighbors graph, because if something is very far away, uh, you're unlikely to pick it. Then this uh, defines a sort of something like a symmetric distance, which is Pij, which is P of J given I and P of I given J, uh, and normalized so that it's between zero and one. Then uh, you do something similar, but um, for the embedding space, so the axes are uh, our original data, the y's here are um, the transformed data that we want to find. And we do, the, so this is a student t distribution, um, a sort of more heavy tail distribution, there's arguments why this is a good distribution to use, and so now we uh, call these uh, QIJ, they're uh, defined similarly, and um, then we will optimize the what's called the Kohlberg Leiber divergence, which is a standard measure to compare different probability distributions, and so we want to make these, distri these distributions, um, PIJ and QIJ, be as close to each other as possible. And as close to each other as possible is uh, measured by um, the uh, kohlberg leibniz uh, divergence, which is written down here. So this is optimized usually using like a gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent, so similar as a neural network. Um, so this means like we will it will randomly initialize the y's and then does move the y's around so that basically these distributions are similar. What this means is very, very roughly, if things are close together in the original space, you want the embedding points to be close together in um, the new space. The student t distribution here says you really only care about the things that are very close to each other. If they're further away, then you don't care so much about ensuring the distances. But so, but so basically, you just randomly initialize these y, uh, these y's as like some points in uh, 2D, and then you do this gradient descent. And so, what the axis you end up with 
have, have no meaning whatsoever. But the pictures you get are great. So this is the picture of uh, TC on uh, the digits data set. So these, these eight times eight grayscale images. Um, and uh, you can see that actually, even though it's an unsupervised algorithm, it grouped the, um, the numbers pretty nicely. So the coloring is done after the fact by the classes, but uh, this unsupervised model nearly perfectly discovered um, the different uh, like classes as groups. It, so we didn't even tell it to look for groups or how many groups there are, but still discovered them. You can see they're not perfect, but some of these things make sense. So for example, here there's a bunch of ones, but the ones with the bar on the bottom are here. And there's a bunch of nines over here, but the nines that don't have a bar on the bottom are here. So it's kind of interesting that you, it, uh, not only did it discover these groupings, but it also um, found particular variants within each group. So that's, that's kind of neat. Um, and so maybe you could use this kind of visualization to um, understand your data better. Just comparing this to um, PCA, so here is the digits data set with, um, with PCA and also with TSNE. TSNE right now doesn't have a transform method. There is ways to transform new data with TSNE. Um, they're not implemented in scikit-learn right now. Uh, but I think there's other implementations that, that do the transformation. Um, and so in TSNE, I can only call fit transform, which will fit and transform on the same data because there is no transform method. Okay, so here's PCA um, on the digits data set. It's kind of already kind of interesting because you can see the, uh, I haven't, uh, I don't, didn't have uh, to write a legend for the classes, but you can see that some of the classes are already pretty well separated. I think the blue one is uh, zeros, which is quite different from the rest. And so even in this completely unsupervised uh, linear projection, you can already see that there's quite a separation between the classes. But if you run TSNE, you get a uh, much clearer separation between classes. This looks a little bit more messy than the plot I showed before, just because the, the dots are bigger. But uh, it's a very similar, similar graph. Um, as I said, this has a random initialization, so every time you run this, it will possibly give you a slightly different result. Um, because it does like, so it has a gradient descent. And so, who knows? There's a very cool uh, visualization of what happens um, on, like there's an O'Reilly blog post about TSNE that explains it uh, quite nicely, and they kind of hacked into the scikit-learn implementation uh, something to write down uh, images uh, of the iterations. And so you can see basically everything starts being, being a blob of points, and then they like move away from each other so I thought that was kind of cool. You can look, check out um, the, the blog post if you're interested. TSNE has one parameter, which is called perplexity. That kind of controls the sort of how much you want, how, how close you want the groups to be or how far away is far away. Um, it's sometimes a little bit tricky to, to tune. I think the default is 30, which usually works well, but if you change it, you get different results. So here, this is perplexity equal to two, perplexity equal to 30, to five, and to 300. So, um, one second. Did I say anything smart about this? No. Um, yeah, so, or maybe a better explanation is that this is the bandwidth of neighbors to consider, and people found that on small data sets, smaller values work better on large data sets. Um, large data sets uh, work, uh, larger perplexity works better. The author says uh, 30 always works. So you can either always leave it to 30 or play around with it. Um, here's the same on the uh, like 
two moons data set, my favorite trivial data set. And um, you can see that if you use actually perplexity equal to 30, in this case also works pretty nicely. Whereas you, if you go lower, you completely destroy the structure of the data set. There's, um, so if you don't know distill.pub, distill.pub is sort of a new kind of journal that does like very awesome ex um, explanations of algorithms and they have always great visualization. Check out distill.pub in particular. There's uh, one about tuning uh, perplexity in TSNE and they have like sliders you can play around with and it's all amazing. You should generally look at all things published at distill.pub because they always look cool and have like a very well written. All right, um, before we go to final questions, I want to briefly mention two other algorithms. So TSNE is sort of commonly used, but it's quite slow and it scales not so nicely in two bigger data sets or like where we have many samples. It also doesn't actually scale that nicely if you have many features. Um, for example, for the MNIST data set, which we'll see in a second, um, which is higher dimensional, people very often use PCA first to go down to say 50 dimensions and then use TSNE on the 50 dimensions instead of using TSNE directly on the original data set. So it's like a two-step procedure. First you do the sort of the simple dimensionality reduction with PCA, and then you do this more complex nonlinear dimensionality reduction with uh, TSNE. But still it's kind of slow. Um, it's slow but it's very established. There's two newer algorithms that I want to mention. Um, one of them is UMAP. Um, this is done by uh, Leland McInnes. Hopefully that's how you pronounce his name. Um, uh, he has a pretty a nice implementation of this. And um, here you can see on the left something on the um, MNIST uh, digits embedded with new map. If you do it with CSNE, it looks similarly nice. Uh, but here his UMAP implementation took two minutes, whereas the TSNE implementation took uh, 45 minutes. So that's quite a big difference in terms of performance. Um, here on the right hand side is another visualization using uh, Fashion Amnest. Uh, Fashion Amnest is something that was like the Amnest data set is 70,000 images, um, each 28 times 28 in grayscale. People and people use this for way too long to benchmark neural networks. And then at some point, someone uh, created Fashion Amnest, which also has 10 classes, also is grayscale, and has exactly the same dimensions, but it's much, much harder because it's like low resolution images of clothing. And so you can, instead of running anything on Amnest, you can use the same code, you can run it on Fashion Amnest, and intro, the results will be much more interesting because it's much, much harder. Um, and so anyway, he ran the same stuff on Fashion Amnest. You can see the example on the right-hand side. Um, in this case, some things were not as perfectly uh, separated. The sneakers and the sandals are maybe uh, a little bit mixed up, actually, in the clothes. Uh, but the, the trousers seem to be very well separated. Well, you can make of this what you want. Anyway, so if you have a larger data set, definitely uh, probably worth checking out UMAP. Um, Basically, I'm not going to go into the algorithm, but uh, um, it's you can create nice visualization, ho hopefully much, much faster and of similar quality. Because these are visualization, it's kind of hard to say what does good quality mean and what is the right trade-off between compute and um, quality of the embedding. Another one that came out um, slightly before uh, UMAP is LargeVis. Here I link to an implementation that's not from the original authors, but that is probably like a nicer to use implementation from Python or easier to install. Um, so this uses very efficiently constructed nearest neighbor graphs. And um, so on the left you have Amnest example, on the right you have um, document vectors for uh, wiki. So this is a much, much bigger data set. It has, what, tw 28? 2.8 uh, million vectors in uh, 10 dimension, uh, in 100 dimensions. And so this is another alternative that potentially gives you similarly, uh, similar quality embeddings at as much faster speed. 
th there hasn't been a good comparison between large WIS and UMAP. Um, I don't know which one will prevail. If I recommend you play around with both of them and share your results online so people have more, like, more data to discuss which ones are good. All right, we're perfectly on time. So um, any more questions? No questions. All right.